A nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. An enemy at the gates is less formidable, for he is known and he carries his banners openly. But the traitor moves among those within the gate freely, his sly whispers rustling through all the galleys, heard in the very hall of government itself. For the traitor appears not a traitor. He speaks in the accent familiar to his victims, and wears their face and their garment, and he appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation. He works secretly and unknown to undermine the pillars of a city. He infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist. A murderer is less to be feared. In IPAC, The Voice of America Part 1, we saw how an extremely small minority of people, many of them dual citizens, are exercising a grotesquely disproportionate amount of power over the American Congress, because 100,000 people represents a mere 0.032% of America's total population. As the Declaration of Independence rightly implies, there are certain truths which are self-evident. And one of those truths is that America's support for a very small nation, Israel, is way out of proportion to the interests of its own population, as well as to the interests of world peace. It is also self-evident that lying, blatant favoritism, vote-buying, bribery and corruption, and much else that is underhand and criminal, have constituted a seeping scourge within the United States for at least the past half-century, and the Israeli attack on the USS Liberty is a striking example of the suppression of the public's right to know what is really going on. In the January 16, 2004 edition of Stars and Stripes, the late Admiral Thomas Mora, former commander of the U.S. 7th Fleet, wrote the following. On June 8, 1967, Israel attacked our proud naval ship, the USS Liberty, killing 34 American servicemen, and wounding 172. Those men were then betrayed and left to die by our own government. Israeli reconnaissance aircraft closely studied the Liberty during an eight-hour period prior to the attack, one flying within 200 feet of the ship. Weather reports confirm the day was clear with unlimited visibility. The Liberty was a clearly marked American ship in international waters flying an American flag and carrying large U.S. Navy hull letters and numbers on its bow. U.S. military rescue aircraft were recalled not once, but twice, through direct intervention by the Johnson administration. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara's cancellation of the Navy's attempt to rescue the Liberty, which I confirmed from the commanders of the aircraft carriers America and Saratoga, was the most disgraceful act I witnessed in my entire military career. To add insult to injury, Congress to this day has failed to hold formal hearings on Israel's attack on this American ship. A little over 34 years later, this extraordinary interview took place. Five Israelis have been detained in New York for acting suspiciously following the 9-11 attacks. But, unconditionally freed by the FBI and back in Israel ten weeks later, one of them had this to say on live TV. Our purpose was to document the event. To document an event that took America and the rest of the world totally by surprise? And the same dark forces that let Israel off the hook time and again were at work when a substantial majority of the United States Congress felt obliged to sign letters pledging their support for Israel when the United States Vice President was virtually slapped in the face with a wet fish by Tel Aviv over the building of housing for Israelis in illegally occupied East Jerusalem. And the Congressional Letters of Support actually followed the insult. It was like a bunch of supplicants saying, Hit me again. Insult me all you like. It makes no difference. I am your friend. So what's going on? Here's one highly probable scenario, which I've called the treasonous dollar drain, engineered by IPAC. Every year, loyal U.S. citizens dutifully pay their federal taxes, which are then used for many purposes, one of which is to supply aid in various forms to Israel. 
currently estimated at being about $3 billion per year. Some of this aid is used to buy US-made weapons, which allow Israel to continuously threaten its neighbors and enables them to finance the hugely expensive apartheid wall, effectively fencing off the Palestinians and making them prisoners in their own land. It is self-evident that some of this money is bound to find its way back to the United States to be used to top up the election campaign funds for politicians, who, when elected, will be very keen to vote even more aid to Israel next time around. So, not only are American taxes being used to support the apartheid state of Israel, some of that money is being used to help elect candidates who are more interested in getting re-elected than they are in America's best interests which means that Americans are actually paying for the demise of their own democracy. Yet democracy is something which successive US presidents have been crying out is a basic right for everyone on the planet. What hypocrisy! It doesn't much matter which candidate wins, Democrat or Republican, or at what level, congressperson, senator, vice president or president. He or she, having taken the proverbial 30 pieces of silver, is now expected to do IPAX bidding. The penalty for not doing so being the withholding of campaign funds when the next election circus comes to town. It is estimated that up to November 2008 about $114 billion have been contributed by Americans to Israel. And what has America seen for that money? Absolutely nothing. Quite the reverse. The constant tensions in the Middle East, extending through Afghanistan to Pakistan, mean a growing threat to all American citizens because of their president's likelihood to continuously escalate the warlike attitude and threats against any nation in that area which Israel says is a threat to them, Iran being the nation currently in Israel's hate sites, and one cannot help but wonder which nation in that troubled region might be next. The price of IPAC stranglehold on the United States is virtually immeasurable. And if Israel has its way, and through IPAC, succeeds in its push for a war against Iran, that immeasurable price could escalate to include the devastation caused by a third world war. It really is time for Americans to wake up and to think about the unthinkable, and to do something about taking their country back from the foreign power, Israel, which is insidiously, through IPAC, calling the shots in the United States Congress, the Senate, and yes, in the White House itself.